Welcome, anyway, to a very special part of uh, Kwame Berlin 2015. This is, in fact, the Kwame Challenge final. It's the very first of its time, so it's going to be a very interesting um, couple of hours here. I'm James Bellini, in case you haven't been listening to any of the general lectures in the theatre there. I'll be hosting this exciting final uh, climax to the challenge. Um, by the way, just so you know, I'm an author, um, a TV broadcaster, but above all, a futurologist. And the next generation to me is the future and the work that you're all doing as teams uh, are going to be uh, playing a very important part. Um, I've got a passionate interest in innovation and of course the good ideas that will help shape the world tomorrow as well. So I'm going to be deeply interested in what you're going to tell us this afternoon. Now, the purpose of this challenge is to nurture and support the next generation of electrical engineers and create new connections and opportunities for both upcoming student innovators like your good selves but also those already working across the electrical manufacturing industries. Now this first session, this take, uh, this final today, will decide the winner in front of all of you and you can perhaps have a few minutes at some point to ask the odd question, not many but certainly um, representing the industry and of course our distinguished panel of industry judges and first then before we kick off let's uh, introduce our judges sitting in the front uh, in the middle if that for the football photograph Giorgio you'll be holding the football would you not uh, Marsili are the uh, Kwame challenge sponsors and uh, Marsili's judge is Giorgio Cacabardo he's uh, been with Marsili for something like 27 years I'm told and has extensive experience in coil and motor winding technology and he shares Marsili's passion for innovation. Here on the left uh, of me here is Ben Emke, is president of Emke Consulting and managing editor and owner indeed of the Impact Paper. He takes a close interest in the global energy industry, especially transformers and their components. Fourth along is uh, Thomas Michalik, he has over 20 years experience in technical management and is technical director of Poland's uh, standard motor products, covering all aspects of design and release into production. At the far end is Anderson Pacheco, he's a specialist in production engineering, has been involved in many important projects in Asia, Europe and North America and elsewhere, with a deep passion for staying up to date with the latest and best technologies in global motor manufacturing. He's currently senior design and R&D engineer with Embraco in Brazil. in Brazil. And sitting here, the distinguished looking gentleman, if I may say that, Tim, is Tim Marks. He's a secretary of the Association of Electrical and mechanical trades and since he took over the association back in 2001 it's actually grown to become quite a significant global player as an international body now with a presence in Europe, the Gulf and Southeast Asia among many many industry roles as a professional he represents the UK on the international IEC TC2 standards committee for rotating equipment but many many other roles as well. Now quick minute on the rules of the game if you like this is how this session is going to work each of our four finalists will have a maximum maximum of 10 minutes each to present their projects to the panel of judges in front of me and they'll try to convince them that they should be the winner of this first ever Kwame challenge. Each project will have one to two project leaders presenting. Doesn't matter whether it's one or two, but there's always a team behind these uh, projects as well. So sometimes it'll be one, sometimes it'll be two. Good luck to you all, by the way. The judging process will be kept very simple, very concise. Each judge will have a score sheet and each and every project presentation will be judged using four simple categories. One, communication and presentation. Two, relevance to industry needs. Three, technical innovation. And four, potential for integration into the industry. Those are the four criteria on which those judgments will be made. Judgments, the judge will score each of these categories on a ranking of one to five. At the end of each of the four presentations, the judges have been asked, please, to make sure that uh, all categories are scored and to add up uh, a total as well. Once all the presentations have been completed, the engine room of this event, Hannah, and Chloe from the uh, Kwame Challenge team will quickly add up all the scores and inform the judging panel of the winner. I'll then ask uh, Giorgio, please, uh, to uh, announce the winner and, and indeed uh, announce the winner and probably hand over the prize. So big job this afternoon. Right, let's move on. Now to our four presentations. 
I'll announce them in turn. Right off now is the presentation of student project number one, Lucas Kissner with his colleague Marcel Nöller. Good luck. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our presentation of the KIT 14E, a high-performance electric racing car. My co-presenter today is Marcel Neller. He is um, team leader of the electric drivetrain this season. Um, I'm Benedikt um, Schmitzrode. I'm his predecessor um, of the last season in this position. Before I start the presentation, please um, let me say something about our team. Um, we are from Car Racing. Car Racing is the former student team of the Karlsruhe and University, uh, Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Um, each year, 70 students um, are developing, um, building, and constructing two racing cars: one with a com conventional combustion engine and one with a fully electric drivetrain. Um, and we present our new electric car. In the next minutes we are talking about um, the predecessor, the KIT 14E, um, the roots of, the of our new car. Um, afterwards Marcel is um, explaining the new motors of the KIT 15E and is going to give an outlook in the future. The Quid 14E is our fifth electric car and our second all-wheel driven car. In this season, we start to develop a, a, a drivetrain, a self-developed drivetrain. Um, we introduced in this year um, self-developed motors. Um, the power electronics is still on the test bench. Um, yeah. The special of the concept is that all of our motors are centrally mounted. So um, they are not in the wheel hubs, um, which is a very, uh, which uh, we are able to achieve a very low center of gravity and a high efficiency of the car. We use um, a planetary and a spurgy to transmit the motor torque to the drive shaft, um, which you can see in the picture. Um, with the experience of our last car, we developed our new car. The overall goal was to improve the efficiency, to decrease the mass of the car, and in general to improve the performance of the car. Therefore, known as a very um, invention team, we um, choose a new motor concept called Dual X Drive. Um, you can see the picture. We uh, tilted our motor gearbox units in two axes to remove our spur gear and to achieve a low center of gravity and more efficiency of the drive shafts. Also, we improved the motors. We uh, increased the maximum um, revolutions um, to 30,000 and um, removed the limiting factor um, of the motors, the cooling, um, because we invented an um, coil winding oil cooling. To get you a rough idea, here you can see the CFD picture of our new motor. Also, we improved our vehicle uh, control systems like traction control, active yaw control, recuperation, and so on. Marcel is now going to explain the new motor. So, thank you, Benedict, and I want to give you a warm welcome. Um, my goal is to bring you the new motor to explain what we are planning this year and what the manufacturing made by students is about. So, first of all, uh, we had to think about the motor itself. Should it be uh, lasered? Should it be manufactured in other means? And we decided to laser cut them and then to stack them after varnishing. Here you can see a picture of us lasering or cutting uh, the sheets um, to <laughs> have a good crew of car racers um, with Stiefelmeier to get the varnish on the plates. That means a lot of work. That means every single sheet, with, which is about two and a half thousand of them, uh, has to be varnished and then brought to uh, a little oven and then 
brought it out to get it stacked up. After packaging, you can see a picture here of a finished stator. You can see the little tooths, the little teeth uh, on the outside. This is for oil cooling. This is our passage between the left and the right winding head to have the oil flow from left to right, to have both winding heads cooled by oil. And of course, you should take a break. You have done a lot of work. You have given a lot of patience to have final uh, stators. Um, now the second part of the status begin, the winding. So while looking at this interesting video, they are hand winded. You can see it here. Um, unfortunately, this winding was not correct, so it was took out <laughs> after winding it. So our guy has to do all the work again. While looking at the, the video, we brought our own motor from last year with us. And um, we want to show you um, the last year's motor with water-cooled water -cooled shell with the windings, the, the drive shaft, the rotor itself, the stator and the outer shell. Um, this year it has gone very much smaller. This one was 20,000 uh, RPM. The new one is, as Benedict mentioned, at 30,000 RPM. Much lighter, about one kilo. We want to achieve about 30 kilowatts continuous power out of it, up to 40, maybe 45 kilowatts in peak with an active mass from the new motors of three kilogram. Okay, we winded the motors and this one does not work anymore. Yeah, the stators are done. They are winded, they are insulated, they are happy and ready for use. What you're doing with the rotors, the rotors have buried magnets, so we are packaging them as the stators, um, baked them, uh, coated them with varnish, and then we bonded the magnets into the pockets. It's a long-taking process. <laughs> it, uh, it's quite interesting how the, how the rotor soaks up all these magnets, which are falling into this, uh, into this piece of metal. And after that, we press all the parts together to receive one final and finished rotor. There are some balancing sheets to have the, the rotor balanced up to 30,000 RPM and then the rotors are done too. What now? Take a sleep. You really deserve it now. You have done almost the whole motor. But what to do if you have a motor? We want to test them. We have built our own test bench for electric motors. We have all built our own test bench for our power electronics, the inverters, but that's a more future uh, project. Um, we can test them, we have our own DC-DC, we have our own uh, possibilities, uh, measurement electronics, all the things you need to determine the parameters and the essential things on the motor. There you can see <laughs> one of the uh, first steps with, uh, with the test bench, all the lights are glowing up. Uh, the guy here is responsible for this test bench and he was very happy to have the lights uh, glowing up and so he raised his finger very proud. Um, in the end, um, I think we took out a very, very small part of our car. As you can see here, there are many parts beginning with carbon fiber, with aerodynamics, uh, the electronics, the power electronics, the HV system, the battery, which are all way too large to explain here, um, but we want to invite you um, to one of the events we are driving. We are driving in UK Silverstone, in Hockenheim, in Hungary and in Spain. And as a special part, we brought a car with us, exactly this one, the Kit 14E, the car of last year. We brought it to the Stiefelmeier st stand in hall 3.1 stand E48. We want to invite you to have a deeper look to discuss the, the uh, things we could not mention. We have no, not, en not enough time for it and we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Uh, presentation number two is Mark Englund from Leibniz Universität Hanover. Hello. 
hello. So, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark England, and <laughs> how shall I stand? Uh, and I'm here with my colleague Lucas Kistner. We represent our team here. Uh, our team is an international collaboration of the Leibniz University in Hanover, the Purdue University in Indiana, and the company Lensim. We work together on an inline integration of an inverter drive system. And the area we investigated in is and our induction motors for industrial applications up to 7.5 kilowatts. And usually at these applications, you have an induction machine with a modular decentralized drive sitting on top of it, like you can see in the, in the picture. Uh, these drives are quite large and bulky, so they cause problems to mount these drives in certain industrial environments. Therefore, we wanted to create a design which um, has an integrated drive in the motor housing. But this new consideration caused new problems as well. First of all, we have a heat load from both the motor and the power electronics uh, to get dissipated. Then there are thermally sensitive components we need to be aware of. And then lastly, um, we have new cylindrical shape limitation, which means we have a new power electronics housing with a um, cylindrical inner diameter. So we have to do something with the PCBs as well. Therefore, we had a few working steps to do. First of all, we developed a new model housing concept, which, as said before, needs to redesign the PCBs for the new limitations and the uh, space constraints. Then. We calculated losses for both the drive and the motor, which then were contributed to a new cooling concept, the new thermal management concept. Additionally, we developed a health monitoring system which shall detect, uh, shall detect failures early on. So next off, I want to present you our design just first of all, just the sequencing. On the left in black, you see our motor. Then next comes up our shared heatsink. Then in red, there's a thermal barrier. Then comes the new power electronics housing. And in the end of the motor, we have a plastic housing for the control and I.O. board. If you take a closer look into the motor, you can see there is our power module right here in dark red. This is connected directly to the heat sink to uh, efficiently remove all the heat out of the, of, of, of the power module, which consists of an inverter and a rectifier. Then you can see our th uh, thermal break or thermal barrier in red. This should uh, provide a preventation of heat flow coming from the motor over the heat sink into the power electronics housing, because there are all the sensitive components parts like the DC link capacitor, for example. So we had a rectangular, one single rectangular uh, power board PCB, and we had to split that up. As you can see in the picture, there are two PCBs over here. And on the next slide, you can see these two PCBs. The first one is on top, the second one on the bottom. With bottom at the top and uh, bottom view. The distribution of these PCBs um, were made in a kind that functional groups remain together. For example, on the top right PCB we have the power module and on the top side of the, po of the power module PCB we also have the DC link capacitor as well as the gate drivers, where on PCB2 there are, for example, the EMI filter and the switching mode power supply. Also, thermal aspects were taken into account so that the hot power module with all the losses is close to the heat sink as well as thermally sensitive components like the DC link capacitor is quite far away from the heat sink. So these PCBs aren't just round and circular. They have three symmetrical extensions, as you can see, and this is due to our mounting system. This consists of 
mounting rings, which are these rings over here, and standoffs, oh sorry, and standoffs. So that provides us an easier assembly as well as establishes a ground connection between all the PCBs and the housing. Additionally, it holds the PCBs in place, so voltage spacing requirements are uh, safe at all times. Now I'm giving the mic over to my colleague for the thermal analysis. Hello, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, to calculate the heat uh, in the motor and the heat distribution of the drive system, we built an electrothermal model with worst case parameters. The ambition was to set up simulations for uh, both the operating point and several overload scenarios to check the impact of the different heatsink models we made up and the uh, thermal barriers as well. Uh, in the picture, this is just the rough schematics of uh, the the things we, we calculated with a thermal model. Uh, you can see the uh, big amount of heat which is dissipated from the heat sink and in result the uh, low heat flow in the power mod uh, behind the power module at the PCBs. So this is our final heat sink. The sink must be able to dissipate redundant heat from both the motor and the power electronics. Uh, you can see the uh, space for the power module in the back side. The motor is located in front of the heatsink. And we used forced connection for this heatsink because we want to save some room and not have uh, large uh, cooling fins. The two axial fan, uh, sorry, the two axial fans we used are located in this black box on the bottom of the heatsink. Thank you. Uh, you can see the direction of current, which uh, leads from the bottom towards the left and right side of the heatsink through the fins of the motor housing. So in this axis. We were also preparing a health monitoring system for early detection of failures. Uh, the most critical parameters are the temperature of the power module and the stator winding, especially the end winding of the stators. And we were also plotting the rotational speed of the shaft, the DC link voltage and the phase current. So in the medium run, we want to replace the induction machine we used with a synchronous or a reluctance machine for less losses and a smaller heat sink, or maybe we can get rid of the fans. And we also want to use silicon carbide semiconductors, uh, again, for less losses and smaller space between the PCBs due to smaller capacitors or smaller coil. And Additionally, we want to put up a long-term diagnosis to get rid of uh, mistakes or weak points we didn't find in the building phase. Yeah, right now we finished building the motor and uh, I'm sorry, but we don't have any photos of the, of the tests because we started yesterday. If you're really interested, I have it on my phone, but <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to mention that we didn't work uh, alone, but with four students of the Purdue University in Indiana, with their mentor, and with two other students from our university, and two, uh, I don't know, they are, they are somehow our mentors as well. Sylvia Sulk and Francesco Quadrone, as well with the company Lancer, uh, with Mark Collins from Massachusetts and Volker Grubbs, who's sitting in the back of the audience. Hey. <laughs> so basically, we are done with our presentation. Thanks for listening. I don't know, if you have any questions, you can ask them later. And if you want to talk to us about a special topic, we're here after the presentations are done. Thanks. Thank you for that. Our third presentation, our third project, 
is going to be presented by Lucas Vallas from the Bialystok University of Technology. Thank you very much for introduction. My name is Lukas Valus and I want to uh, present uh, you my project name, Project and Implementation of Isolated DC-DC Converter powered by DC Circuit of Voltage Inverted. Uh, I want to start from uh, politics. Uh, European Union authorities want to use uh, renewable power sources instead of uh, traditional power plants and uh, that's why there is need to uh, project uh, more and more efficient power converter to transfer energy to energy grid. On the screen we can see typical structure of voltage inverter used to transfer energy from renewable power sources to the energy grid. And uh, my project uh, concerns uh, in uh, highlighted in red uh, DC DC converter used to supply the control system. Uh, there are a uh, couple problems. Uh, because sometimes uh, wind speed change or for example solar radiation, there is a change of input voltage of uh, my converter. And uh, also during startup of renewable power sources, generated voltage is very small. What's uh, also uh, uh, further uh, expands uh, my uh, input voltage of the converter. Control circuits are very sensitive uh, for uh, interference. That's uh, why uh, there is need to use uh, galvanic isolation between the power stage and the control circuit. Uh, control circuit also needs a stable output voltage to proper work. Uh, project uh, scopes uh, include uh, design, build and test two power converters work in two different models uh, in order to compare the properties in use with renewable power sources. Uh, based on the mentioned before problems, they were designated uh, critical uh, parameters and other parameters like isolation, input voltage, output voltage, output power and efficiency. Uh, chosen flyback uh, topology is a well-known solution as well as the control used to control the operation of converter uh, but other elements especially transformer is especially uh, specially designed and selected to very demanding technical requirements uh, there are uh, proposed two work of models uh, continuous condition model uh, CCM and non-atypical mode quasi resonant Main difference between these two models is the moment of uh, turn on of the transistor, and we can see that in this case, uh, uh, current value is uh, not zero, and uh, in this moment are produced switching clauses and electromagnetic interference. In a quasi resonant mode, we have a soft turn on of uh, transistor, and that's why switching clauses are smaller and also uh, there is less uh, produced uh, electromagnetic interference. A PCB board was designed to allow free testing and uh, that's why it's uh, not perfectly uh, made in terms of minimizing but for testing is sufficient. Uh, now you can see photos of made prototype converters. Uh, it doesn't look uh, very impressive uh, because uh, PCB board was made with uh, non-professional -profe method, but for testing is sufficient. Now I'm gonna uh, show you uh, switching waveforms uh, to confirm uh, assumptions that uh, in this case, in CCM mode, transistor turn uh, on with uh, non-zero value of current. Now we can see switching waveforms for quasi-resonant mode and we can see that uh, transistor turns with uh, zero current value and minimum drain to source voltage, it's called valley switching. One of the most important uh, parameters is efficiency and now we can see efficiency for uh, low input voltage 
and uh, we can see that only for light load, uh, converter doesn't reach the target level of 80%. For very high input voltage of 800 volts, uh, only for full routed power uh, converter reaches the target level. Now we can see efficiency versus input voltage, and for light load it's very hard to reach the target level, but for full routed power, both converters are over the target level of efficiency. Uh, now we can see a photo from thermal imaging camera, uh, and we can see that uh, output diode and transformer uh, has the highest uh, temperature value, and that's why these components must be properly adopted to these conditions of work. Uh, quasi resonant uh, uh, converter has the same problem, but in this case, uh, output diode has a bigger heatsink, so its uh, temperature is a little lower. Summarizing, uh, there were made two uh, converters uh, work properly and uh, meet uh, their requirements. Uh, efficiency is lower than uh, uh, assumed, uh, but only for special conditions like uh, light load and very high input voltage. They should be paying attention at the uh, voltage input uh, which converter starts their work. For quasi resonant, we can see that uh, it's uh, much smaller, and uh, this is a very huge advantage in use with renewable power sources. Also, this converter produces less electromagnetic interference, and I think it's a better choice for renewable power sources. After the prototype, there is time to build a professional version of converter with some improvements. Uh, to minimize the uh, dimension of the converter, uh, uh, there will be made four layer PCB, PCB board. Re uh, to reduce electromagnetic interference, uh, ME suppression capacitor could be used uh, between the power ground of input and output. Sometimes renewable uh, power sources need more than one uh, separated output, for example, for communication or other, other control circuits, and that's why in the next version there will be three full separated outputs. And uh, there is a method to improve efficiency uh, instead of output uh, diode, that could be uh, use uh, MOSFET power transistor to reduce uh, condition uh, losses on output. Its name is synchronous topology. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And our fourth and final presentation, project number four, is presented for us by Sheng Huan from the University of Liverpool. Hello, everyone. 390,000 US dollar. This is the amount of money we have to pay to build an open power line for only one mile. Therefore, it is important for us that we can fully use its transmission capacity and also ensure it can operate in a good condition. To achieve that, we can deploy different kinds of sensors all around the power line to measure some important data. However, the main problem we have is how can we power up these sensors in the remote area? And batteries obviously is not a good solution because it is almost impractical that we're going to replace these batteries periodically. And therefore, energy harvesting could be a reliable solution to make these sensors totally self-powered. And in this presentation, I would like to introduce a new energy harvesting device to collect the magnetic field energy under the overhead power line. The basic operating principle is actually quite straightforward. Faraday's law. When we put a coil inside the time bearing magnetic field, voltage can be generated. And here, I want to give you an overview first of how our system works. By using a specially designed coil to charge a supercapacitor and then use energy inside to power up a wireless sensor. And in this presentation, first, I would like to talk about the design of this harvesting coil, followed by a matching circuit analysis, and finally, I would like to give you a short demonstration. First is the core shape. Why the core shape is so important, let's look back to the Faraday's law. 
the induced coil voltage actually, as you can see, depends on various things. However, the key parameter that you can play with is the effective permeability, and which is highly related to the core shape. And here, I don't want to talk about complicated design and theory. I want to give you some example instead. First, let's assume we can have a five-right rod placed inside a time-varying magnetic field, and you can see its effective permeability is roughly around 12. What do we do? We just make it longer. You can find out that its effective permeability can be almost doubled. Furthermore, now we keep its length unchanged, but we don't make it thinner. As you can clearly see here, the magnetic field inside has been increased dramatically, which means that its effective permeability is further increased. Now, a conclusion can be made that a thin and long rod can have a higher effective permeability, which leads to a higher power output. However, this is not a good design for a real application. When you think about you have a coil, which is one or even two meters long, it just occupies too much space. Therefore, we have designed a new bow tie shaped core, and by making its two end broader, we can make the magnetic flux focusing in the middle part where the one beams are put it down. And because of this special design, the effective permeability can be increased by seven times compared with the conventional rod with the same length and the same volume. To further prove this concept, we try to compare our bow tie coil with the conventional solenoids nodes in terms of the power density. For the horizontal axis, which means the relative permeability of the core material, and for the vertical axis, which means the power density. First, you can see for the solenoids, its power density actually is quite small. But for our bow tie coil, its power density could be much higher than the conventional solenoids. What does it mean? By giving the same volume, the power generated by our bow tie coil could be five times bigger than the conventional solenoids, and this is a significant improvement. And now we have the energy in our coil, but how can we transfer this kind of energy into a supercapacitor. We need a matching circuit. First, you may ask, what is a matching circuit? Let me give you a real example. Last night, when I was in the hotel, I tried to charge my phone with a plug I bring from the UK. However, I find the circuit here is slightly different. I can never charge my phone until I have an adapter. The adapter here is a typical matching circuit. And the exactly similar idea we can apply in our matching circuit design, although it is more complicated. First, let's use a coil to charge a supercapacitor directly without any matching circuit, and we can see what kind of problem we will have. First, assume the supercapacitor can have an initial voltage of two volts. And only when the input coil voltage is doubled, let's say four volts, the supercapacitor can be efficiently charged. However, we, can no, we cannot always guarantee that the input voltage is four volts all the time, because the, the magnetic field under the overhead of power line is always changing. Therefore, there will be, in some cases, the input coil voltage is only one volt. And in this situation, the energy inside the coil is totally wasted, because we can never use a one volt source to charge a two volt capacitor, isn't it? To solve this problem, we have designed a special matching circuit. By using this matching circuit, whatever the input voltage is, and whatever the voltage the supercapacitor already be charged to, the, e the energy can be always transferred from a coil through our matching circuit and finally get into the supercapacitor. And now, I want to show you how can we use the system we have just designed to power up a commercial wireless sensor. First, we have made a Helmholtz coil in our laboratory to generate a uniform magnetic field. And our bow tie coil is placed inside, connected with a matching circuit to charge a supercapacitor. And eventually, we can use the energy inside to power up a wireless sensor. And once our supercapacitor is connected into the harvesting coil, its voltage will begin to go up. And then roughly after 10 minutes, its voltage will reach to 4.6 volts. And in this situation, the switch here will be triggered on, which allows the energy to flow out of the capacitor into the wireless sensor. And then its voltage on the capacitor will decrease dramatically. 
the once its voltage is below 1.9 volts, the switch here will be triggered off and then the supercapacitor can be charged again for the next operation. A video demonstration actually is available with the link I provided here. And then to conclude from this project, first we have designed a bowtie coil which can have a much higher power density. Secondly, because of this special design, the matching circuit, we can always transfer the energy from a coil into the supercapacitor. And because of these two innovative design, the performance of these systems could be 15 times higher than a reported design published in IEEE Journal. And if this solution could be used to power up the weather stations under the overhead power line, we could estimate the cooling effect from the natural environment on the power line, such as the rain and the wind. Therefore, we can decide carefully what is the maximum current we can pass in through this power line without causing any problem. As a, res as a result, the overall transmission capacity of the power line can be increased by at least 20%. What's more, if this solution also can be widely used in other places, such as in the electrical substation, to power up different kind of condition morning sensor. And finally, if this energy harvesting system, along with the wireless sensor, can be deployed all around the power grid, a huge communication network can be easily built and which would be the foundation piece of the smart grid application. And that's all. Thank you.